Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. As we continue forward in this, our 90th anniversary, one of the real treasures that we hold here at this particular congregation is our name of grace. Grace implies free gift, something that God extends. It speaks the story of both the Old and the New Testament, of a God who reaches out to us as human beings and a God who persists in always welcoming us back. It's an endless hospitality, grace. We can thank our forefathers and foremothers as they thought about, dreamt about, talked about what to call this particular congregation in Love's Park. We can thank them for choosing a name that is a life-giving name, a name which reminds us that it is all about God's desire to always receive us into God's presence in spite of who we are or what we've done. Grace extends as free gift from God. In our reading for today, this the third of four readings that we are encountering from the Gospel of Matthew, focused around the person of Peter. We find a center mark story, the true confession of faith, the true affirmation of who Christ is. You see, Matthew's congregation is thought to have gathered on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. It was a Jewish Christian church. In other words, they continued to hold to the law of Moses as well as the promises of the prophets, as well as the teachings of Jesus. They continued the Jewish practices of circumcision, reminding themselves of the teachings of Father Abraham to whom God first gave the covenant. This was unlike other kinds of Gentile churches that spread throughout the world. Those who look on the outside of the church, even within our own communities of Loves Park and Rockford, sometimes ask the question, why are there so many different types of churches? Perhaps that thought has crossed your mind as well. But the question comes down in some people's minds, then not only what is the difference, but is, are any of you completely right? Well, the interesting thing is we study the early church when the disciples went out bearing the stories of Jesus, like St. Thomas who went to Parthia and out east to India, it is told in tradition, he embraced the gospel stories, told those stories as he encountered different cultures, as he encountered different languages, as he dealt with people who perceived life differently. As he told those stories, the gospel took on the shape of the culture in which it was being proclaimed. This is how Thomas was able to be successful in bearing the gospel in that place quite different from the Jewish congregation, Jewish Christian church to whom Matthew wrote, wrote, and quite different than the churches that Paul planted in the Roman Empire. You see, there was diversity of understandings of faith early on as the stories were told because they were sharing these stories orally. They weren't written down. They didn't have the Bible to take. So as they went, they shared the truths that Jesus had imparted to him. And in today's story, we come to the center point. Despite the differences of opinions around Jesus, this particular text makes it abundantly clear who is Christ. There were many in Jesus' day who were asking the disciples we read here in Matthew, is this John the Baptist come back in the flesh? Is this man that you are following, the prophet of Elijah from a thousand years ago? Is this Jeremiah the prophet from four to five hundred years ago? Or is he some other prophet? When Jesus asked them the question, who do people say that I am? Spent some time looking at North Suburban Library as well as the Rockford Libraries 
just to see what different topics of books appear in the libraries of our community about who is Jesus. Believe it or not, there's a lot of opinions. There are opinions that look at Jesus as a, re a religious revolutionary, a zealot who is coming to overthrow the government. There are those who've written books that Jesus was actually a social reformer who was trying to overturn the social economics of the time. There are people who are writing books there that really refer to Jesus as a good moral teacher, but surely not risen from the dead and surely not the savior of the world and many other perspectives. So Jesus' question was as pertinent then as it is today. Who are people saying Jesus is? I might turn it around and ask you the question. Who do you understand Jesus to be in your life? And what impact is he having on your life? Now, in the last few weeks, we've heard the stories of Peter who stepped out on the water and was soon being uh, encompassed by nearly drowning in the water when Jesus extended a hand of help. Then there's the misunderstanding, even when Jesus is teaching last week, on what Jesus was actually saying. But today, Peter shines. In a few weeks, Peter won't shine so much again, as we know that he ultimately denies Christ and then becomes the one who becomes the center focus, one of the central focuses of the church. You see, I find Peter to be a refreshing example of the Christian faith because when we're honest with ourselves, we do have our own struggles, don't we? There's times where we understand. There's times where we're putting our faith into play. There's times when we're overcome by our own shame and guilt and feel distant from God, somehow feeling unworthy, and we forget all about God's amazing grace. Sometimes we think we can handle life on our own, only to find ourselves spewing water as we're neck deep in the challenges of life. But today, Peter steps up to the plate and knocks it out of the park. Who do people say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. It couldn't be any simpler than that, but also, more difficult than that. This is who Jesus is. He is the son of the living God. He is the hope for the world. He is the one who comes to extend his grace to us time and time again. He is the one why we come back together and confess the fact that we have failed to live as either we have wanted to live or as God has wanted us to live week after week. It's not there to just beat us over the head with our failures. It's to remind us that we need God and to remind us that we are not God. Only Jesus is the son of the living God, the Messiah, the hope for the world. He comes to offer hope, however, for all people. Jesus took down the walls that separate us one from another. Paul said that most profoundly in Galatians chapter 3 when he said there is no longer any dividing wall between us, between Jew and Greek, between male and female, between slave and master. Christ has come to take away those things that have been set in our society that separate us from each other, sometimes saying that I am in a better place or position than another, saying, no, in Christ Jesus, we are all on a level playing field. We all come in with our shortcomings, but thanks be to God, by God's amazing grace, we can never be too distant from God that God cannot welcome us back. Amen? That's God's nature. God's nature extends to all of the creation that Christ loves. And this is part of the fact to which Christ is unique. But not only are we to confess with our lips like Peter did here in Caesarea Philippi, a clearly Gentile city, interestingly enough, where they identify who Jesus is because it becomes a symbol that this confession of faith is for all people, not just the Jews. 
Jesus' Jewish disciples who were gathered there, but rather for the Gentiles who were within earshot in Caesarea Philippi. The gospel is for all people, rich and poor, people of various cultural and ethnic backgrounds. It's a gospel that spans the world. Within that first 20, or 20 to 30 years after Jesus had risen and ascended, the gospel is believed to have made it all the way to the edge of China and all the way to Spain. That small gathering of disciples had done an amazing feat of taking foot and spreading the gospel. How about you and me? It's more than what we confess with our lips, isn't it? It's rather what, how we also apply the teachings of Jesus in our heart. Knowing with certainty that Christ comes to abolish the dividing walls, that Christ comes to extend his amazing grace to all people, God sends us out to be his ambassadors bearing the grace of Christ in this world, in our families, in our community, in our workplace, in our schools, wherever our two feet take us. Many in the early church suffered persecution and suffering because of the fact that they were so convinced of who Jesus was. They were so convinced of his love and his grace that they ex had experienced. They were so convinced by what they saw and heard that when they went out, they risked everything to be able to tell others about him. We live in a changed time where many have fallen away and some have not heard in our own communities. They have not experienced that amazing grace. They have tried many other things to try to fill the void of the soul, trying to understand life, to make sense of it. But you see, until we connect with the creator of the universe, the one who has made us, that is where our soul's homing actually takes place. If home means anything warm and good to you, you understand the analogy of homing in the presence of God. If home for you is painful, ignore the analogy. But there is something homing that happens when we come back into the place where we know where we belong. Many in our world search for that place of belonging in various and other kinds of means. It's not all bad searching, but we know that we can't take it with us. We know we can't even take those that we love so dearly in this life with us. It only comes to us in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now we do believe that someday we shall be gathered together at that great banquet table, but it begins now as we home in the person of Christ, as we drink deep of the waters of his grace, as we understand it's not about us, it's about Christ. And therefore the promise holds true that he says, come, follow, come, experience my love, come, experience my forgiveness. For whatever troubles your soul or your mind, the forgiveness in Christ covers all things. That's pure good news. It's in Christ alone that we find this hope and this promise. But the gospel does not end there. Jesus then turns around to Peter, therefore to his other disciples, therefore to all followers. And he gives this command, whatever you loose in heaven or on earth will be loosed in, in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. For those of you who went through confirmation Number one, for those of you who paid attention, number two, for those of you who remember, that's number three. This is talking about the power of the keys. It's talking about the gift of forgiveness. It's talking about our ability to be the hands and feet of Christ as we are agents of his grace in this world. It's that kind of mercy and forgiveness that made the early church strong. Not only was it the persecution they faced, 
that became the seeds of new faith for many because they demonstrated how committed it was to them once people tasted of the amazing grace and love of Christ Jesus. That they didn't have to do something first. That they didn't have to make all these changes first. They didn't have to embrace anything first. They didn't have to make things right first before Christ would be made right with them. That was the grace that began to shake and transform the world. And that is what our world hungers for today. I believe there is a deep desire to find a meaning and a purpose and a homing for each individual. And try under our own might, we will fail. It will come up short. But with Christ and his embrace, as we confess with our lips, as we believe with our hearts, and as we live in our life, we find the peace that passes understanding. We find that peace of mind that settles the soul even in the midst of storms. We find that joy that cannot fail us even in life's greatest sorrow. This is who Christ is. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You are God in the flesh. And his words and his actions reflected God's amazing grace. Great name, people, for a church. May it be seen in our hearts and our lives. May it be lived out and claimed for our own souls. May we find the homing that we seek for ourselves. Even though many will say, that sounds too good to be true. There must be a loophole. There must be a catch somewhere. That's not who Christ is. No catches, no loopholes, just amazing grace. So it's in Christ alone that we stand. He's our rock and our salvation. Peter got it right. And like Peter, who in a few Bible stories away will deny knowing Christ, at Christ's greatest hour of need. We keep coming back, don't we, people of God? Because we hunger and thirst for that amazing grace, to be reminded of it once again, to be embraced by God's goodness. Thanks be to God for a person like Peter, who Christ could see had potential, but also, like us, serious limitations. May we continue to live out Christ's life within ourselves, his amazing grace. And may we stand and share the hope we find in Christ alone. Amen.